doesn't love a feel-good news story. Two people become friends when someone texted the wrong number. To Jamal's shock, the offer, just as sweet as ever. Of course you can. That's what grandmas do. Feed everyone. Two people eat lunch together when one of them looks sad. A stranger buys diapers for someone who can't afford them. Other woman who heard it all stepped in to pay for the rest. $120. I can sit and watch that stuff for hours. Until my cynical brain kicks in. And if you want to show a random act of kindness to people around you, one thing you can do is smell really nice. That's right, I have a sponsor. It's Scentbird and they're awesome. Okay, so Scentbird is a fragrance subscription service that lets you shop from not one, not two, not three, but 600 brands of fragrances. And it's, and it's flexible so you can skip any month without penalties. And it lets you try a new high quality designer brand fragrance every month for just $15. That's like 50 cents a day. Every month you get to pick what you want. There are no surprises. Uh, so you got perfumes and colognes and lots of unisex options. I personally don't think you need to gender it. You can, uh, you can wear perfume if you want to wear perfume. You can wear a cologne if you want to wear cologne, whatever, <laughs> whatever you want, uh, as long as you like the way you smell and uh, you know, other people do too. With each fragrance, you get a 30-day supply so you can try out fragrances before committing to a full bottle. And you can upgrade to receive two or three products a month. And they have great brands. They have Prada, Gucci, Versace. They're not, they're not smell-alikes. They are the authentic thing. They work directly with the brands. Some of these fragrances cost like $150, $200, $341, up to even $500. And you can get that for $15 a month? Yeah, I'm in. They come in these really cool bottles and these really cool pouches and these cool colors. Am I saying cool enough? And look how these bottles work. That's really neat. So I received three products this month. I received Continuum, Raw Spirit, and I received Brioni. Uh, I like them all. I really like the Brioni. I smell uh, fantastic right now. And I don't have teeny tiny hands. These aren't those little samples you get at the store. This is a good amount of fragrance. What I like too is they come with these cards that, that tell you about the product, kind of what the scents are and what it what it smells like. I really like the Brioni. It smells great. I I smell great now. And uh, yeah, I'm really thankful for it. So yeah, go down below to our link and you can discover new fragrances by taking a simple quiz on Scentbird based on your preferences. And with my code, believe it or not, you can get 55% off your first month. And if you're wondering if this is available in Canada, yeah, it's available in Canada. Hey everybody, thank you so much for liking and subscribing and commenting and all that wonderful stuff. I really appreciate it, really appreciate you. I put the links down below for the social media as well as our Patreon, as well as the link there to get your sweet deal on Scentbird. I'm gonna sound so pessimistic at first, but please bear with me. It's gonna get so optimistic, you'll be like, what? There have been a number of fantastic articles and videos pointing out just how so many of those feel-good or inspirational stories actually just emphasize how messed up our society is. The media, especially local news, loves a feel-good story about people pulling themselves up by their bootstraps, something that fairness and accuracy in reporting calls perseverance porn. Like those stories about kids paying off student lunch debts. I started crying. <laughs> I couldn't believe that a five-year-old could think of doing something like that. She could have just told her mother, I want to go to Target and buy a new toy. Eight-year-old Keone Ching, a second grader at Franklin Elementary in Vancouver, holding a check that's bigger than he is. It's for raising money for school lunch debt. It's not as inspiring when you realize just how depressing the idea of lunch debts are and why there should be programs to make sure that children are never denied food. And a kid in front of me didn't have enough money and they had to put their tray down. And that made me sad. Yeah, that makes me really sad too. But why is it this kid's responsibility to fix it? 
or stories about teachers pooling their sick days when one of their colleagues is diagnosed with cancer. A touching story appropriate for the start of a brand new school year. A South Florida teacher battling cancer and undergoing chemotherapy ran out of sick days. So feeling desperate, he placed a plea on Facebook asking for help from other teachers in the state. And as CBS 4's Maribel Rodriguez reports, he got a response he never expected. Why should that even be a thing? There are teachers, they're responsible for the next generation of leaders, and we can't even take care of them when they get cancer? Or this story about a high school robotics team that made a wheelchair for a kid after his parents' insurance denied him one. They've helped so much. I mean, this really helps him explore like he's never been able to before. <laughs> it was really cool being able to do such an amazing project. As for the prize-winning robotics club? I think we won here more than we do at our competitions. We go again? <laughs> They're at the controls when it comes to acts of kindness. Don't get me wrong, these kids are wonderful. But again, the real story here is why didn't the insurance company pay for it? And why aren't we going after them with pitchforks? And this is one kid and one robotics team. How many other kids are out there being denied wheelchairs by evil corporations? But then there is this subgenre of the inspiring news stories that isn't about people doing inspiring things, but the almighty doing inspiring things. Here, a Michigan couple getting the shock of their lives when they got an alert from their security camera in the driveway. It was kind of like really unusual. I've never ever seen anything like it. I was like, wow. I mean, that is an angel. The photos are exactly how they were taken. I choose to believe it. I think it's an angel. Take a good look. Don't blink. Don't even blink. Blink and you're dead. Many, including their pastor, said that they believe this image, captured by a security camera, shows an angel hovering over the family's truck last week. But way more common than stories about people freaking out about a moth that went near their camera are stories about religious iconography surviving disasters. Like when a cross survives a tornado. And not a whole lot of, of your building left standing, but there is one thing, and you told me you believe this was a sign. If you look up here, um, there's, there's a cross left. Getting yeah. a little bit emotional. I know this is tough. Blessings this family can see are what the storm left in its wake. Oh, across the wall. She's really good. Oh, She's right God, there. Get on her neck. She looks this is pretty good, much the you? only wall still standing. There's one. Uh, yeah, it's really right something. Here. What these stories forget to mention is that these storms kill people. Like recently, when this pastor was being interviewed on the Today Show after that tornado that killed at least 88 people. But tell us about, there's a beautiful altar that somehow stayed intact. Yes, that's our communion table, and it has a wonderful uh, carving of uh, the Last Supper on it, Michelangelo's Last Supper. It's uh, been, it's the center of our, our worship experience. It survived. To be clear in the whole interview, it's obvious that this pastor cares way more about these people than he does about this object. But it's interesting that the host thought that this would be an inspirational story. Like this story about people finding a Bible. 18 of the 25 lives lost in that storm died in Putnam County. And now survivors are talking to us about the light that's shining through this dark time. Bliss segment is live in Cookville with a woman's story. Things seem very bleak, but yesterday there was a message of hope. Two Tennessee Tech, Tech students were out here volunteering, helping clean up when they found something unexpected. A Bible opened up to a verse with a message of hope. Is God really up there caring more about his book than the 25 people who died? died? Because Bible surviving disasters is the most common of these types of news stories. A miracle, whatever you believe in, call it what you want, but Bibles left untouched by fire at a West Virginia church. It's a book, but not just any book. They found a Bible inside the car. A car where nothing else survived, the Lord's words were still there. Shall be covered in flames, but look at what survived that fire, this Bible. The man who lives there says it's a sign. This was the home of the Reese family. Last week, a fire burned up everything. Well, almost everything. This next picture shows a bedroom in their home. It was Rachel's bedroom. She was living right there with her aunt and uncle to go to college in Brunswick. And you can see the fire just destroyed a room. And now you can see this picture we're trying to get to. This is Rachel's Bible. The only thing that survived in the January fire tears through a bone secure home. Yeah. But it's what was left behind that can only be described by the homeowner as a miracle. His Bible. So if we believe these things are miracles, we have to believe that God is an interventionist God and that he can stop things from burning. Which means that the nearly 3,000 people who die in house fires each year in the U.S. alone don't get saved. But God's books are saved, even though there are plenty of other copies.
And also, why didn't he save the earliest manuscripts? This next one made me the most sad. For Christmas, this family's left with a holiday struggle. All the money that's going to be going towards Christmas is now going to have to go. I'm trying to divide it up to where I get some something. The truck caught fire out of nowhere. The flames ready to jump to the house with children inside. But thankfully, something malfunctioned on the truck, causing the horn to blare. They began looking for things to salvage. It's the first thing I asked for, to see if my Bible was okay. Finding a promise of hope to raise them from the ashes. The Bible was down there on the ground down there, and they had to pry it up from the case. A true miracle. That Bible we've been carrying since I was 13. Each page pristine. A fire made it so these kids won't have Christmas, but it's a miracle because a Bible that had a protective covering around it was left intact. The thing is, a lot of these Bibles are leather bound. A lot of them have that protective case. They're a much more dense book than other books because of how big the Bible actually is, which means they're made with thinner, higher quality pages. So although they obviously can burn and often do, they may not burn as quickly as other books. The material that usually binds Bibles sometimes has a chemical that can keep it from burning quickly. And when the pages aren't open, it can save it from the flames. And when they do burn, the news doesn't come out and say a Bible burns, so God's probably not real. And then there's this guy who seems very nice. Such a remarkable coincidence. You know there must be more to it than meets the eye. New York Times bestselling author Squire Rushnell collects those stories in a series he calls God Winks. He goes on the Today Show and the 700 Club to talk about what he calls God Winks. But then I realized there was no coincidence to coincidence. And if there is no coincidence to coincidence, then what do you call it? A man takes a long road trip with his family and stops at a random gas station. As he walks past the payphone, it rings. He answers. It's for him. An airman becomes a prisoner of war in Vietnam. While he endures six years of harsh captivity, a 16-year-old cheerleader prays for him every night. Forty years later, their paths cross in a 55,000-seat baseball stadium. According to best-selling authors Squire Rushnell and his wife, Louise Duart, these aren't mere coincidences, but divine appointments. It was no coincidence to coincidence. We needed something to call it yes. if it came from a divine source. So this little word, God wink, yes. I put into my manuscript, and it fit. And don't get me wrong, I love a good coincidence story. Like when my uncle was in Toronto for work and happened to go into the coffee shop I worked at to get a coffee. Or when the same thing happened when my old college friend from Calgary was visiting Toronto. Or that time Scott Bakula came in. That wasn't a coincidence. I just wanted to mention again that I met Scott Bakula once. I told him I wrote a one-act play about him. He thought that was weird. Ziggy, if you hear me, take me far, far from here. But anyways, his books tell stories like this one about a boy who was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. I was nearly speechless with that diagnosis. My son said the doctor was amazed at the intelligent questions our young Jake had asked. And people were awed that Jake seemed to know exactly what to do, even pricking his finger to test his blood. I, of course, knew immediately that it was a God wink. Of all the books in the library Jake could have chosen for his book report, he had picked Shoot for the Hoop, which is about a boy with juvenile diabetes. It was not coincidence, I was sure of it. Or the woman who said no to a gift of a scarf from her dad before he died of cancer and then later regretted it. Days before my birthday, I had received a package with my Aunt Nan's writing on it, saying, don't open till your birthday. I couldn't wait. I went upstairs to my bedroom and I sat quietly and I opened it up. My hand felt something silky. I started shaking. I just knew. I really knew. It was a beautiful brown and orange Hermé scarf. The note read, Dear Lisa, Happy birthday. Years ago, your father gave this to your grandmother on her 80th birthday. She, in turn, gave it to me. I'm sure she and your dad would want you now to wear it in good health. Love, Aunt Nan. I yelled down to Brendan, I got it, I got it. Dad sent me the Hermes scarf after all. It was clearly a God wink from heaven. Again, not to sound too cynical, but if God can intervene to give somebody a book or a really expensive scarf, couldn't he, you know, not give a kid diabetes or not give that woman's father cancer? Yes, lately. 
Okay, let's stop for a second. Let's turn off the news. Why do we get stories like this? Why do people feel the need to report on a Bible or a cross not burning? Why do people need stories about an interesting coincidence actually being a message from God? Why do people need stories about kids paying for other kids' lunches? And why did I spend the whole Christmas season watching videos of people getting surprise gifts in Idaho? And that is what Secret Santa wants to do for Phil and Debbie. We have a few gifts for them today. Or as I called them, Mormon surprises. It's pretty simple, actually. And what do you want the takeaway to be? Well, I want the takeaway to be hope mm, and encouragement. Yes. That's yeah. basically what it is. We're all looking for hope. The world feels messed up. We have a pandemic, school shootings, terrorism, hate, climate change. Dr. Phil exists. Because you are a loudmouth bully. So sometimes we need a little glimmer of hope in our lives. Remember, Red, hope is a good thing, maybe the best of things. And no good thing ever dies. Something that says it's not all bad. Something that says someone's looking out for you. It's also why there are so many sermons about it. Number one category of prescription medication is antidepressants. That people are discouraged, that people are devastated, that people are distraught. It's not going that well. I would actually argue that the very existence of antidepressants is actually very hopeful. <laughs> They've changed my life in a huge way. But yeah, go on. Because there is a lack of hope. There's a loss of hope. There's a longing for hope. The word hope is a very, very important word. It's a word of optimism, a word of cheerfulness, expectation. All of us need hope about many different things in life. And when you have hope, you do anticipate, you expect, you look forward to something. When you have no hope, there's a sense of dread. You find yourself in the muck and mire of something that you can't put your finger on. Where is my hope? In other words, what am I living for? Smallest level of faith is hope. Faith is not mountain moving faith at first. It just starts with you're hoping for something. You're hoping to see your kid get off drugs. You're hoping that your marriage is going to get better. You're hoping that a door is going to open. You're hoping that you're going to meet somebody that will love God as much as you. You're hoping that you're going to get a job in this economy. Faith it's not a floating hope. I saw Holly watch a movie a few years ago. It's been quite a few years, and they, they called the movie Hope floats. I didn't watch the movie. Holly had it on. Are you saying that you're too manly for hope floats? Because I don't care how much of a man you are. Sandra Bullock and Harry Connick Jr. were at their most charming. I can't. I can't dance anymore. That's not just a conversation between two people. This is no Daddy Warbucks Connick Jr. This was 90s Connick Jr. Birdie, birdie, birdie. <laughs> And also Egg was in it as a little girl. I'm sure that Egg is a very nice person. I just don't want you spending all Damn. your money getting her all right. glittered up for Easter. Oh. <laughs> and yeah, you're gonna cry. And what's more manly than crying, Stephen? But yeah, 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 back to hope. And, and I, I, I don't know anything about the movie, but I know that the title is inaccurate because real hope is like an anchor. It doesn't float on the surface of your situation, but it gets down to the bottom and holds on tight while you're going through hell. Wow. Yeah. That was impressive. I didn't know how it hit me. I mean, none of it meant anything, but the confidence is inspiring. I mean, I don't think any of the words you said actually meant anything, but could you show us with a ball? See, now look, same ball, different surface didn't work. Because in order for this to do, what it's meant to do, the surface that it bounces on has to be, she's on it, some of y'all are remedial. It has to be, it has to be, hope it bounces back. I can bounce back from rock bottom. As a matter of fact, the harder the bottom, the higher the bounce. God let me be cut down for a little while, but I see a shoe coming from the start.
It had to be hard. <laughs> that is such a good example of a meaningless analogy that doesn't say anything. We are no way that bouncy ball, or or is it hope that's supposed to be the bouncy ball? You, you can have hope without hitting rock bottom. I think he just wanted to play with a ball in church. I also really look forward to the comments about bouncing on hard bottoms. I feel like there's a few different directions you can go with that. And, and I look forward to what you have to say. The harder the bottom, the higher the bounce. But so far, what these sermons show is that no matter how much faith you have and how dedicated you are to God, bad things can happen and will happen to you. So of course you have to put your hope in Jesus. Hmm. Why isn't this working? And as you look at what is set before you and the resources you have to your uh, own disposal, you realize, I am not sure how I can survive this, make this, endure this, conquer this, or even live through this. And the question is, where do you go to get hope? And the key is this, that, that hope is the byproduct of faith. But just like a mother births children, it's faith that births hope. So your joy in tribulation was rooted first in the promises of the God of hope, so that it began in hope, but as you are proven in those experiences of life and joy and peace rise up instead of bitterness and anger as you're tested with trials, you have more hope according to chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. And so probably when he says, may God fill you with joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope, he means, I want the God of hope producing hope and faith which yields joy and peace. I want all of that to have an overabundant effect on more and more hope. So do I want to put my hope in someone who puts me through tests and trials and tribulations? That's sort of like putting your hope in Jigsaw from the Saw movies, right? Rick, is, is this a Saw thing? Are you seriously sawing the Vindicators? Morty, I'm a drunk, not a hack. If you break the rules, lose the game, or try to leave, you will die. Like in... <clears throat> Saw. Well, I, I think we've seen enough. I'll just... I mean, I guess a lot of Jigsaw's victims did end up putting all their hope in him. Is God Jigsaw? Note to self, video about Is God Jigsaw? Have you given up hope? Have you surrendered your potential? Jesus Christ is presented in the Bible as our blessed hope and the hope of glory. When there is hope, hope generates enthusiasm. Hope generates excitement. It generates butterflies in my stomach, and that goes to tickles in my spine, and that creates goose pimples, and then that penetrates my mind, and then the... But all these people are saying is that God is a source of hope, right? And in a way, that's right. Even if you don't believe in him, you understand that belief in something can be a source of hope for people. You know, like in Battlestar, when Adama says that he knew where Earth was, but he didn't actually know where Earth was? They traveled far and made their home upon a planet called Earth, which circled a distant and unknown star. It's not unknown. I know where it is. Earth. And he justified it by saying that it gives everyone hope and a common goal. And Earth will become our new home. So say we all. So say we all. Bears. Beats. Battlestar Galactica. Bears? So yeah, I'm not saying there isn't hope in believing in God, even though we can obviously discuss the ethics of giving false hope. But it's another thing when you say you can't have hope without God. Those who forget God have no hope. Now friends, we see the proof of that statement in literally every single sector of our society. That the further away we get from God, the less hope we have. Now the converse is true. The closer you get to God, the more hope you're gonna have in your life. The most hopeful people on the planet Earth are those who live closest to God. And the most hopeless people on the Earth are the people who feel far away from God. Because that, my friends, is classic manipulation. Are you one of those persons who's feeling hopeless? Nobody cares? Nobody's interested in you. 
You've had all kind of experiences. You've had all kind of things. And you've been with all kind of people. But somehow there's something missing in your life. Well, the same thing that's missing in your life is the same thing missing in her life. Until you are willing to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, listen carefully, you will keep on drinking from the same old wells of sex, alcohol, drugs, money, on and on and on and we could go of things that people keep drinking of. And here's the problem. All of those things are like salt water. When you are thirsty, you don't want to drink salt water. That is there so that if you do leave and then you start to feel hopeless, you will start to wonder if that hopeless feeling is because you left, even though you also felt hopeless at times before you left. He was in his last year as Chancellor of Germany. And he started right in. He said, young man, do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Well, I was surprised. I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, so do I. He said, if Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, I see no hope for the human race. He said, there's not one glimmer of hope as I sit here in my office unless that hope lies in the resurrection of Christ. And he said, when I leave office, I'm going to spend my time writing about this hope. And we talked for about 40 minutes about the hope of the resurrection. I picture the Christian life as a kind of spiral up to, into ever-increasing hope, which leads to ever-increasing joy and peace, which leads to experiences with God in trial, which lead to more hope until we get to the place where we walk by sight and not by faith anymore. Through the seven levels of the candy cane forest, past the sea of twirly, swirly gumdrops, and then I walked through the Lincoln Tunnel. Everyone wants hope. Everyone is searching for hope. And the church is selling. But they're not the only ones, and they don't own hope. So if you are deconstructing or if you have left, can you really say there is hope? Hex, yes, you can. First of all, you were able to walk away from a belief system that you were probably indoctrinated into from a young age, and now you're making decisions and forming opinions on your own? That's hella hopeful. There is hope out there. There's so much hope out there. There is hope when people stand up against hate. There is hope when you see our children fighting for the future. Although we are just kids, we understand. We know. We are old enough to understand financial responsibilities. We are old enough to understand why a senator cares about re-election or not. We are old enough to understand why someone might want to discredit us for their own political purposes. But we will not be silenced. It has gone on long enough that we, just because we are kids, we are not allowed to understand. But trust me, I understand. People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. There is hope when we see amazing breakthroughs in medicine and science. There is hope when you make small changes to improve your mental health. There is hope when you have people who love you. And there is hope when you care about whether or not there is hope. However bad life may seem, there is always something you can do and succeed at. While there is life, there is hope. Thank you for making it this far. I appreciate you. If you know somebody who might benefit from this, send it their way. And you have yourself a wonderful day. And don't forget to go to www.sentbird.com. Tell them I sent you. Uh, uh, use the code, believe it or not. And once again, I got the Brioni, I got the raw spirit, I got the continuum. They smell awesome. I love the Brioni. And uh, you can also download their app. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Work, 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 Sky Moon. <laughs> <laughs>